Okay, now let me finish what I got here because um, I'm going to put this on the board. I'm going to go through a couple of them. Uh, again, you're going to get this on the site, so don't worry about copying everything down. Here's some points that you have to do with this divide and conquer. Buy properties that are on one tax parcel, first thing. Look to split groups of buildings and individual buildings. Check with municipalities for any procedures. Uh, that would be like the planning commission meetings I went to. Examine utilities for possible sub-metering because if you've got an eight unit building that you're dividing into two, you really want to make sure those utilities, gas meters, electric meters, water meters, are separated as well. This is not a condo conversion or any kind of zoning change. Um, don't worry about number six. If survey company that was used, uh, I'm sorry, use survey company that was used on sale of the building. So when every one of you are buying your buildings, you're going to use a survey company to give you a survey. I would call that survey company to do the divide for you because they've got most of the information already. It's going to save you time and money. Um, get a, I'm sorry, must use a non-commercial appraiser approved by the bank. Get non-commercial bank to set up an equity line of credit. Increase NOI of property while in process. And use equity line of credit to buy more income producing real estate. Okay? So, yes. I, yeah, go ahead. You're increasing your, you go back and refinance and get a higher mortgage, right? So that's going to change your, your after debt service cash flow because your debt service is going to go up. So you have to factor that in. Your debt service is going to go up. However, it's going to go up because you've got that equity line of credit, which you're putting into another property that those tenants are paying for that debt service. Are we good on that? Okay. You got that, right? That has to be part of the equation. It's got to be a part of the equation. You are putting that into more income producing real estate. It's part of the equation. Absolutely. You got to cover that debt service. Absolutely. Does your interest rate go down when you refinance as a resident? Maybe. Maybe. That's going to be, uh, depend on the borrower and the bank or lending institution you go to. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. A line of credit. Uh, are you paying taxes on that? Is that your question? Ta uh, uh, a loan proceeds are not a taxable event here in the United States, so you do not pay taxes on that. You good? Okay. See, I wouldn't do something like that if I had to pay taxes on that portion of it. It's a loan proceeds. You don't pay taxes on it. Right? Now, when you go to sell the building down the line, then you're going to pay taxes on that gain. Absolutely. Yes? John, I was just thinking about that. Um, so basically, you buy it as a multi, commercial multi. You got financing, according to Chris, 75, 25. Yep. All of a sudden, you broke it down. You go back to the bank. It's not a commercial multi, it's a residential multi. The financing on it now is 50-50. How does that... 50% loan to value? Yeah, so now how does that factor all in? Um, your loan just changes. Your LTV drops. That might change the terms of your loan as well. So you're going to have to discuss that with your lending institution. Okay? Yeah. Sam, you waving to me or you got a question? No, I got a question. You have a question? Yeah. That's great. Anyway, I think that... Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Sam. What does that do to your uh, property tax? What does that do to your property tax? Sam, did, did I talk about that? Yeah. Yes, I did. Oh, Where sorry. were you, Sam? Was... You were outside? I'm sorry. Oh, no, here. <laughs> Let me go ahead and just create a small class for you, Sam. Um, <laughs> real quickly. That could change your property taxes. They could go up or down. In the cases they've gone up, it's been marginal because, you know, your parcel size changes and maybe the rate changes a little bit. So it could go up or down. Expect that. Okay? All right. Let me check my time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're doing real well. Here's what I want to do. I got to deliver a story. And then I'm going to, um, I got some stuff in the morning to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. 
you're inside my head again. I, I'll got to get you out of there. Because um, I'm picturing Wayne doing his happy dance behind the curtain. Anyway. So tomorrow, I'm going to talk about how we kind of utilize that for creativity. I'm going to talk a little bit about it now, actually. And then I'm going to talk about it more in the morning. You're going to love tomorrow, by the way. You love today? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. Um, during my whole career, when I left the corporate world, and I was walking out of Russ's office. Did I tell that story the first day? Or second day? First day. When I left the corporate world, and I was in the environmental field for 10 years, I quit. And I walked out of there, and I was thinking, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to start my own company in the environmental world, and I'm going to invest in real estate. Those are my two big things. And so I had the real estate thing starting to work. I would go to all the events. I would read every book I could. I, I would sit seriously, if, if like somebody was buying something, like the car wash guy, I would almost, you know, tackle them, get in front of them, very much like what you guys do with me. That's great. I love it. That's fine. Um, it's a very common thing, though, especially at the break. I always get, John, I have a quick question. <laughs> sure you do. Anyway, that's fine. No problem. So I, when I was getting with the car wash guy, I want to find out what they're doing. I want to know how they're doing it, what they're doing it, so on and so forth. Meanwhile, I was building the environmental company. And I've always used creativity as something that um, propels me ahead of everybody else. I don't care so much about competition. Like, I'm not in competition with you or any of you here. If you guys want to invest in Chicago, that's great. I will out create or uh, creative or out create you. That's probably a better way to say it. Because I want to be creative. I did, I've done that all, my whole entrepreneur career. That's how I've been able to be an entrepreneur for the last 14 years. Check this out. Not a lot of people know this story. Um, I had to walk uphill both ways to school as a young child. No, that wrong story. Sorry. No. So I leave. I quit. I've got a mortgage. I've got you know, kids. I've got all this stuff. I start my environmental company the very next day. In my mind, it's been started for years. I go and um, I start hustling. I start getting clients. I start working it. And I get a call from somebody I know that says that a company has 12 million gallons of oil to dispose of. Now, Tyler, are you writing all this down for my you know, uh, VH1 life... Uh, Story. What do they call that show? Crib. Crib. MTV Cribs. What's the other one? The bio one. VH1, the bio one. Where are they now? Or... Real life story. Right. Okay. That's what I need. Write this down. <laughs> so I'm hustling. I'm doing all this. I get this call. 12 million gallons. Holy cow. Well, my competitors all in that market are mom and pops. They're big companies like Waste Management, BFI. Now, here in, uh, how do I, here in Chicago, on the south side especially, um, the garbage companies are, they're just, they're, they're organized. <laughs> so um, I'm in this business now, fine, whatever, that's cool. So uh, all these companies I'm competing against now, and all of these companies are dealing with um, this, uh, 12 million gallons. I don't even know where this 12 million gallons is coming from, so I have to source it. I source it and find out that it's coming from a Fortune 500 company called Monsanto. Anybody heard of Monsanto? Show of hands, a lot of people, okay. So here's where the chips came from. Everybody, everybody's heard of Taco Bell? Okay, um, some people may have had that today. Well, uh, a few years ago, actually uh, about 10 years, well, no, longer than that, 12 years ago, something like that. The Taco Bell had a media disaster in which they told everyone that they're going to this genetically altered corn oil. Well, people were eating these chips that they were using this genetically altered corn oil and they were breaking out into a rash. Well, it turns out it was an allergic reaction to something totally different than the genetically altered corn oil. Well, because it was a media disaster, uh, Monsanto is saying, hey, 
we have to dispose of this corn oil, oil basically. And so my competitors take this and it's an RFP, request for a proposal. And my competitors turn in their proposal and I source it, I finally get on the bidding list, I turn in my proposal. Now, I know for a fact that these are not only big companies, but these are companies that I know that are just connected and just, right? So um, I think to win this, I've got to be a little bit creative. And most, uh, well, all of my competitors said, I will dispose of this for around a quarter per gallon. A quarter per gallon, okay? 12 million gallons, a quarter. Uh, Monsanto is paying how much? Three million bucks. So I take a look at this from a uh, chemical standpoint, and not to get complex here, but uh, oil has a certain BTU, meaning that's British thermal units, for those of you that don't know. It has a certain energy when burned. So I call a company called uh, Coke Refining down in Houston, Texas. Uh, Coke Refining takes oils and other things and burn it, burns it into the alternative fuels method. So I send them a sample, and they do water analysis on it, BTU, all this, these things, viscosity. And uh, uh, they call me back, and they say, um, John, we will, uh, it's going to be 40 cents. And I'm like, 40 cents what? And they're like, we'll pay you 40 cents a gallon for that stuff. <laughs> Uh, can you hold on one second for me? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right. So I hang up the phone. I kind of passed out kind of thing. <laughs> I was on the floor doing the crappie flop kind of thing. That was my happy dance behind the curtain. And I called Monsanto and I said, uh, turned in my bid to them, I didn't call them, I turned in my bid, and my bid was I will pay them 15 cents a gallon. I will pay them 15 cents a gallon. Now, so, uh, so didn't know if it would work, I'm pulling that out, that's how it was. I didn't know after the fact that I was the only guy that was paying them. I didn't know this till after everything was done. So I pay them 15 cents, I win the bid, I crap myself. <laughs> um, not only did I win the bid, but I arranged it that Coke Refining would send barges to uh, St. Louis, Missouri to pick up this oil, and it was FOB, free on board. <laughs> <laughs> I do the deal, 40 cents, I pay, uh, this is all done by wire, I pay uh, Monsanto 15 cents a gallon, I'm paid 25 cents per gallon for 12 million gallons of oil. Now, not a lot of people know that story, but I have taken that creative level in every single thing I do. I had to get creative when I met Heather. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, right? I had to do all these creative things. So as we're winding down today, because we're gonna have uh, Yoshi on here very, very shortly, I want you to think about this. I'm going to leave you with one thing, uh, another kind of story to wrap this day up on my end. And then tomorrow, I'm going to show you how to create all the money that you want to create with respect to your real estate investment. I'm going to show you this live for my next trick. I will levitate. <laughs> no, but I will show you this. I want to show you, number one, just to touch base on this divide and conquer, how we use creativity with that. And then Yoshi, you're gonna take over, right? Okay, you got your computer? Is it the same as my computer? You didn't check that yet, did you? You see, Yoshi, there's more than creativity than just being half Japanese, half Mexican, <laughs> okay? So, you're thinking, divide and conquer. Oh, you did stuff with oil, big deal, John, right? Daryl's like, I do stuff with baby powder. Um, <laughs> what do you do? What does that mean? And I might say to you, well, let's think about how we use this creatively. I want you all to think about this.
<laughs> I want you all to think about this because this right here, this topic right here is worth every single penny it took you to get here, get involved in the program, the travel, away from the kids or the dogs or whatever it is. This is it. And that is this. What I would do is I would search out people that have properties in which you can implement a divide and conquer strategy. Let's just give you an example. What I would do today is I would start searching for properties that are for sale that I could divide and conquer. Let's say that we find one. Don't get caught up in these exact numbers, just go with me. It's a million dollars, it's for sale. And it's a 20 unit building. And that 20 units is made up of five four unit buildings all on one tax parcel. And you know by going in and doing a divide, that value will increase significantly. So the, the sellers got this listed for a million bucks. You go to the seller and say, you go to the seller and say, I want to buy your property and I'm going to give you $1,100,000. Now, you would have to be a complete moron to say, no, I'm not going to take that. $100,000 more than the offer price or asking price? What are the chances you're going to get that accepted? Probably pretty good, right? All things being equal, probably pretty good. So at 1.1, .1, you're thinking, John, how are you going to do this? Well, I'm going to share with you how I would do this or one of the ways I would look at it. And that is, I know that if I use the divide and conquer scenario here, what I could do is drive value. And in my sales contract, I'm going to have certain things in there. This is kind of like, you're going to have to start to think a little bit differently here than the traditional way. For, the, for giving you $1,100,000, I'm going to have the right to do a couple things to your property. And if I can get those done and prove that I've got those done, I need you to do one more thing. Now, this is a sales contract that might be a little bit different than you're used to, but perfectly legal. Have done it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to offer you 1.1 million, but I need the right to do some things. One of those rights, and I'll write it over here, is I get to bring a surveyor on site. And that surveyor is going to draw imaginary lines, so to speak. And based on those imaginary lines, based on those imaginary what, what are you doing, girl? Oh, you need that because you're like, I love you. The only people drawing water like front center. You're like this, I hurt you. I hurt you. <laughs> Just, who do you need over here? I need the, the Hildebrand. Yeah, well, come on up. We need to see this. Oh, they need to see this, though, they're saying. Five minutes, maybe five. Five minutes, I want to be out there. Okay. <laughs> I just got done telling them this is worth every penny that you put into the program. You're like, I. <laughs> I need to have a separate meeting with you on the hallway. While I'm disrupted, I just need the dimmers as well after, okay? Where the dimmers? I don't know where they are. First name Light? <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. What am I doing? What am I doing? By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue this stuff tomorrow as well, okay? They got a real bright future. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to say I get to bring a survey on site, and also I get to draw imaginary lines, and also I'm going to bring an appraiser on site. If I can, pre-closing, I've got another contract pre-closing. If I can prove that I can raise the value of this, and I've raised the value by what I'm doing with a surveyor, um, you're going to do one more thing for me, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Let's say by doing this divide and conquer, we increase the value by $1,400,000. I'm sorry, by $400,000. So we bring the value up to 1.4. It's proven by the appraiser that we bring in after the surveyor comes in to draw his or her lines. 
I'm going to say to the seller, if I can prove that $1.4 million in value, I need you to add me to the deed by way of quit claim deed. That's the document we use to transfer ownership here in the States at 25%. Why am I asking to be added to the deed of the property? Anybody? Control, somebody said. Fees is another one. What else? Yeah, for financing, because you know what? This isn't a new purchase anymore. It's a refinance. And refinances are easier commercially than new purchases. Much easier. Refinancing to pay a partner off happens all the time in real estate, in today's market especially. So I asked to get added at 25% of the deed via quit claim deed. Now I have ownership, I can refinance. Now this is all laid out in the contract. The contract is the important thing. The contract is the important thing here. What we're gonna do is refinance that. Let's just say this is a year down the line, I don't care. And we refinance this at 80%. So 80% of this would be 1.1 1 .1, 1,120,000. You subtract out the 1.1 that you owe the seller from the refinance, they go away, and you have 20,000 left over in which you can do whatever with. He stays on title until you refinance him out of there. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you have to wait a year. I'm just saying, oh, use six months. I don't care when you use it. This is down, I'm just saying maybe the real estate market's healed. Instead of 75%, you get 80. Okay? I'm just doing it so the math is, right? So you refinance it. You pay off the seller. The 1.1. He's getting $100,000 more than what he was going to get on the open market. Probably more because people discount that price. He's happy. You're happy because you get into a property with, by the way, no money down. Zero. Do we still have to make sure everything works? Debt service coverage? All that? Yes, yes. I just want you to think a little bit differently. So if you have no money... I would start thinking about, okay, what are some of my options? I would at least take this as a tool, file it in my mind. This is an option. Does that make sense, everybody? No. So that's one way, just one of the ways, that I would start to get creative with some of this stuff. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to show you more ways. I'm also going to show you ways in which you're going to limit and reduce your down payment. I'm going to show you how that happens. So what I'd like to do now is take some questions, and we're going to wrap up the, the day because the plats are going to be, I was going to say evacuating. That's almost too urgent of a thing. But we are going to be transitioning. That's probably a better word. And uh, so let's take questions. So you, we're going to at the question period. Now we're leaving um, still right at that time. Okay. So yes, qu question. Can you bring that to a Go away, I'm going to do that myself now. So, yeah. Scott is saying, if you bring that to an owner, what's to say that he's not going to say, hey, go away, I'm going to do that myself? Well, number one, you have a contract with him, so it's going to be hard for them to do that if they get that under contract. Number two, even when you explain this to people, Number one, they don't get it. Number two, they wouldn't want to hassle with it. I know that sounds crazy, but that's reality. I've explained this to so many people, and, and only the hustlers see, see it, get it, and I'm doing that. I'm doing that. So it's almost like saying I live in a life of abundance rather than scarcity. Um, I understand what you're asking by that, and that's true. At first, I thought about that. In reality... Very few people do it. If I sat here and told everyone, well, this group is probably a different example to that. But if I sat here and said, hey, a pot of gold, I can tell you where a pot of gold is right now, but you've got to do these 237 things. 
and you got to do them in the next 60 days. Few of you would even attempt it. Few of you would. Actually, in this group, probably quite a few. But in, I'm talking a normal <laughs> environment, very few people would. So that's kind of my answer to that. Okay? Yes? Um, how do you know that they're all going to be on the same tax roll? Um, how do I know they're all going to be on the same tax parcel, you mean? Yeah, at first, when I first started doing this, I had to go to the county. And so what I would look for is um, either a building with a roof line that I, I knew I could divide, or I would look for clumps of buildings. I called it grapes. I wanted to find grapes, meaning a ton of four units together, a ton of duplexes together. I call those grapes. Now I don't need to do that because technology tells me where the tax parcels are with regard to the buildings. And so it makes it a lot easier yeah, for what I do. I do. Yeah, I do. Yep. Good questions. Chris? Um, mine, mine was pretty much the same. I was wondering that uh, 1.4 million uh, that you were going to have it you know, reassess that. Like, he, he, when does the uh, actual owner of the building get uh, privy to that information? Because it's got to be on the contract. The owner of the building gets privy to that prior to close. So I'm, that appraiser is going to come in and write up the appraisal, and I'm going to say, see, 1.4 million. And typically, I'm going to say, like, probably, can, I'm going to increase it by 300000 But whatever that value is, I'm going to be added to the deed at 25%. So whether it's 1.3, 1.35, 1.4, I don't care. It's, I'm going to be on the deed for 25% of that value. Now, let's say that it doesn't work out. I don't close. There's going to be language in that contract that removes me from that deed kind of thing. Okay? And there may or may not be tax consequences with that as well. That's why you need to talk with your um, tax professional on, on this as well. Okay? Yes? So, can I just go over what, I'm still kind of stuck on what you did there. Right. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, so, you, you bought that piece of property. You look like, you're, you're asking the question like you're in pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That look, that look is the same look that that $700 million guy gave me. He said he was flabbergasted, and I was like this. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that. Okay. And I'm going to give you a check. Okay, so I'm right. You, you, you bought that place, got your name put on the title, went to the bank, and then paid it. So he, you paid it. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aren't you glad you're part of the Martell group? Do you like today? Did you like today? Did you like today? That was fun. Wait till tomorrow. And I hate to keep pushing that off, but you're going to love tomorrow. Because okay. all of this stuff that I talked about with the formulas, how many people, by the way, know the formulas? Because I may not tell you the secrets tomorrow until you tell me the formulas by memory. How about that? <laughs> Another question. Anybody? Yeah. Great question. The appraisal has to come in higher based on the sales comparison approach than the income approach. As you've noticed, I said I haven't done it the last couple years because of the state of the real estate market in my area. That's because of 2010, 2011 is when we kind of took our hit. That is starting to change right now, especially in areas like Phoenix, Florida. Now I'm looking to go back there because stuff's going up. Does that make sense? Okay. Great question, though. Whew. I'm exhausted. And I got these ladies behind me. Yes, Mike. You mean when you get added to the deed? Yes. Yeah. That's, in, that's absolutely in the contract. And, um, you know, for those... Maybe I'll do a, a special session just on that 
We'll do a call. I'll ask Steve or Brahman to do a special session on that, and we'll see how we can put that in. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about the contract. I'll show you an example of one and the language in there. Would that help? Okay, so I'll, I'll talk to him on that. Just, uh, I need to ask you a question that you were flabbergasted. You said that you were going to change your interview with Bronwyn. What would you say differently than now that you would say before? Um, you're awesome. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't say that before? Okay, all right. Anyway, well, thank you for, oh, one more. Um, I don't know. I would love to do that. Actually, with these events, normally we do a challenge. We don't, are we doing a challenge here? No? Yes, we are. Maybe. Yes, we are. Yes. Try it. Yes. But, oh, that was, okay. So normally we'll do stuff like that. But yeah, I would love to be on that. That would be awesome. I would totally love that interaction with personalities and all of that. You never know. Never say never. Right? Tyler's working on that. Yeah, we're working on that. Um, anything else? Well, thank you for today. Did you enjoy it? Okay. Yeah. You're going to. You will love tomorrow. We're going to start right at 9 o'clock. Yes. And we're going to start right at. Is Steve speaking at 8 or at 9? Nine? 9. 9. You will love tomorrow. Steve speaking at 9. Uh, we have a ton to cover tomorrow. Please bring your deals. I need three things sales price, NOI, and market cap rate if you can get it. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn this over to Yoshi. Uh, after these announcements, thank you.